akilam chatare nagrenan sate punan swaltrik ananta sakus tat anke yadna bisindu ruha kanchana loka padma garbe tyuman bhagavate pranato smitasmai yeah go ahead what translation my dear lord at the end of the millennium at the end of each millennium the supreme personality of godhead garbhodakashai vishnu dissolves everything manifested within the universe into his belly he lies down on the lap of seshanak from his navel sprouts a golden lotus flower on a stem and on that lotus Lord Brahma is created. I can understand that you are the Supreme Godhead. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Dhruva Maharaji's understanding of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is complete. In the Vedas, it, it is said, Yasmin Vignate Sarvamivam Vigyatam Bhavati. Knowledge received through the transcendental costless mercy of the Lord is so perfect that by that knowledge the devotee becomes acquainted with all the different manifestations of the Lord. Lord Shirodakashai Vishnu was present before Dhruva Maharaj, who could also understand the Lord's two other forms namely Garbhodakashayi Vishnu and Karanudakashayi Maha Vishnu. Regarding Maha Vishnu, it is stated in the Brahma Samhita, Yashai Kanishvasi Kalamatava Lambhya Jivanti Loma Vilaja Jagalandanata Vishnur Mahansaya Yashya Kala Vishesho Govinda Madhipursham Tamaham Pajamin at the end of each and every millennium, when all the material worlds are dissolved, everything enters the body of Garbhodakashai Vishnu, who is laying on the lap of Sheshanaga, another form of the Lord. Those who are not devotees cannot understand the different forms of Vishnu and their positions in regard to the creation. Sometimes the atheists argue, how can a flower, how can a flower stem sprout, sprout from the navel of Garpudak Shai Vishnu? They consider all the statements of the Shastra to be stories, a result of their inexperience in the absolute truth and their reluctance to accept authority. They become more and more atheistic. They cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But a devotee like Dhruva Maharaj, by the grace of the Lord, but a devotee like Dhruva Maharaj, by the grace of the Lord, knows all the manifestations of the Lord and their different positions. It is said that anyone who has even a little bit of the Lord's grace can understand his glories. Others may go on speculating on the absolute truth, but they will always be unable to understand the Lord. In other words, unless one comes in contact with a devotee, it is not possible to understand the transcendental form of the spiritual world and its transcendental activities. All right, so this is Dhruva Maharaj, who's been doing austerity. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Dhruva Maharaj been doing austerities for six months, and the result of his austerities was that the Lord appeared before him in the forest there in Vrindavan, Madhuvan forest in Braja. And Dhruva Maharaj is only a young boy, five years old, but the Lord had enlightened him, touched him on the head with his conch shell, and empowered him with knowledge to be able to offer prayers 
to the Lord. When the Lord appears to people, it is expected that the devotee will recognize the Lord and offer prayers. You know, sometimes we do get people who say, oh, I saw Krishna, Krishna appeared to me. And then I asked him, did you, what did you do? And they said, no, I didn't do anything. I said, why not? <laughs> you know, God, if the Lord appears to you, then we should recognize him. First, the first thing we should do is offer obeisances somehow, at least either if not by falling down, then at least by folding our hands in prayer and offering words of glorification. So we should speak words glorifying the Lord. And Dhruva Maharaj is doing that, although he's only a child, he's speaking about the glories of Lord Vishnu. So in the purport, it's mentioned how Lord Vishnu has three different functions. Lord Vishnu is a Purusha avatar. Purusha it means he's taking on the responsibility to do the work of creation. The initial creation is done by Vishnu. Later, the secondary part of creation is done by Lord Brahma. But initially the creation is under the control of Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu, he also is responsible for maintaining the universal order. Whenever there's some disturbance in the universe, then Lord Vishnu will arrange for an incarnation. A suitable avatar will come. So the avatars, they will, they will come from the form of Lord Vishnu. Maybe you know, there are, the, the Jayadeva Goswami sings about the Das Avatars. Das Avatar Sotras, it comes in the, uh, in the, uh, is it Gita Govinda? In the Gita Govinda, Jayadeva Goswami's song, Gita Govinda, he, he begins with the Das Avatar Sotra glorifying ten prominent incarnations of the Lord. Actually, there are many others. If you read the Srimad Bhagavatam in the third chapter of the first, first canto, then you can read about a number of different avatars who appear. So these different avatars, they all come, they have their origin in Lord Vishnu. And sometimes people even think Krishna comes from Vishnu. And I remember looking in the dictionary, I looked up the word Krishna, and it said the eighth avatar of Vishnu. But that's not true. Actually, that's wrong. Lord Krishna himself is the origin of Vishnu. Vishnu comes from Lord Krishna. And then Vishnu, has three different names, the, which were mentioned in the purport. One name is Maha Vishnu, or sometimes known as Karana Dakashai Vishnu. Karana Dakashai Vishnu because he lays in the Karana Ocean, the Kajyo Ocean. Kajyo Ocean means that ocean from which all the universes come at the time of creation, Mahavishnu is the first person responsible for the initial creation. All the planets come out of the body of Mahavishnu. All of the universes, they're coming out from the body of Mahavishnu. Just like perspiration is coming from the, our skin pores, when we sweat, you know, in Taiwan in the, in the summertime, it can get quite hot there. And if you don't have good AC, 
then maybe you will sweat or maybe you do some running or you go to the gym you know maybe they don't have ac so maybe you will sweat water comes out from your from the skin pores in the same way maha vishnu is laying on the Kajyo ocean and from his skin pores the universes are coming out universes are coming out just like gob uh, globules of water little gob little molecules of water come out from our skin so the universes come out from the body of mahavishnu and so that's mahavishnu or karana daksha then the second vishnu is garbhodaka shai vishnu Lord Vishnu expands himself into each of the universes. There are an infinite number of universes. We are only one earth, the earth planet is one planet in one universe, but there are an infinite number of universes. And Lord Vishnu expands himself into each and every one of these universes and that form is known as Garbhodakashai Vishnu and in that form as Garbhodakashai Vishnu from his per from his body perspiration again comes enough to make an ocean into in the bottom of each universe so you get an ocean, the Garbhodak ocean, the bottom half of the universe is water and it comes from the body of Garbhodakshai Vishnu and Garbhodakshai Vishnu has Anantashesha with him. Anantashesha is in the form of a celestial serpent and he, he He's on the water, laying on the water like a bed, and Lord Vishnu lays on the bed of Garb, on this bed of Ananta Shesha, which is floating on the Garbhodak ocean. So Garbhodak Shai Vishnu lays on top of Ananta Shesha, who is floating on the Garbhodak ocean, and then from the navel of Garbhodak Shai Vishnu, comes the lotus flower and from that lotus flower then lord brahma takes birth in our universe because our universe is small so we only have four-headed brahma but in other universes brahma has many more heads many many heads because universes are much bigger our universe is quite small and then the lord expands himself further there are three forms of the purusha avatar they're all vishnu but they have different functions one is the maha vishnu or the karana dakashai vishnu the other is the second one is garbo dakashai vishnu who's laying in the bottom half of the universe. And then the third Vishnu is called Shirodakashai Vishnu. And he is the super soul in the heart of all living entities. And he also resides on a planet, which is called Sweta Dweep. There's a planet called Sweta Dweep, and he resides there where he oversees the different affairs of the universe so later on you will hear dhruva maharaj he is given a place the, the lord vishnu rewards dhruva maharaj for his austerities and he tells him he's giving him a place to reside he will go to this planet where Shirodakashai Vishnu resides and it's in the universe it's called the planet uh, on that planet there is Sweta Dweep now Sweta Dweep is an island 
and it's surrounded by the milk, milk ocean. And even the demigods don't get to go there. But Dhruva Maharaj got sent there because Lord Vishnu was so pleased with Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj wanted a kingdom. He wanted a kingdom greater than everyone. Dhruva Maharaj was the son of Uttanapad. And Uttanapad was the son of Swayambhuv Manu. Swayambhuva Manu was the son of Brahma. So Dhruva Maharaj wanted a kingdom greater than even Lord Brahma. So the Lord rewarded him. He gave him a kingdom. He sent him to the pole, the pole star. The pole star is a planet which is, it's a spiritual planet which is situated in the universe. So it's, although it's in the material universe, it is never annihilated. So Dhruva Maharaj is residing there now on this, on this uh, false star planet. We, sometimes we will call it Dhruva Loka, the planet of Dhruva. So Prabhupada remarks in the purport for common people, they think, oh, this is all just a myth. How could it ever be like this? Oh, this is just some fantastic story. This is fairy tale. How is it possible that a, a lotus flower comes out from someone's navel and then someone grows from the lotus flower? They think, oh, it's so ridiculous. So you, some people may think it's ridiculous, but if we look at the theories of the modern scientists, we see their theories about the origin of life are even more ridiculous. Their theory about the origin of life is that everything came out from the black hole. Or they have another theory, the Big Bang theory, well known. There's a Big Bang, and from the Big Bang comes out perfect creation. Could you ever imagine such a situation? That there's a Big Bang, and you woke up in the morning, and the next morning, there it was, Thai Bay with all of its highways and subways and electrical system and water systems and housing and everything. It all just came about in the night. There was a big bang. Is it true? That's what people believe. People believe this kind of nonsense. And when we present evidence from scriptures with a the theory of creation, which is quite reasonable and logical and, and scientific people say oh no this is just mythology this is just fairy tale but their theories are the most ridiculous the most absurd we have no no faith no trust in these people they're always telling us in the future one day just be patient one day we're going to make life, we're going to create life from chemicals. They're always telling us these things, promising, never happens, and it never will happen. So don't be misled by the words of so many scientists. <laughs> they're, they're simply speculators and they're they're trying to understand the nature of life but they're far far away from ever understanding real life so dhruva maharaj is explaining to us about how life actually came about the beginning of the creation from lord brahma and Dhruva Maharaj is re related to Brahma. 
His Lord Brahma is Dhruva Maharaj's great grandfather. The question is who, who to trust? So we point out, you know, the Acharyas who are teaching us the knowledge of the scriptures, the Acharyas are all uh, very strict in their practice. They're very truthful. They're very honest. They're not interested in money. They're not sense gratifiers. They have no material desires. They're simply teaching us the message of the scriptures. But if you look at scientists and you look at their lifestyle and their behavior, you'll see they're all usually meat eaters, drunkards, gamblers, womenizers. They have so many bad habits. Why should we believe their, their words? Just because they have some material education doesn't make them the absolute truth. They don't know the absolute truth. They don't know about the origin of life. And they're, they're, not, they're not worthy of trusting. That's the point. You have to look at their credentials. And credentials are not just, oh, he's a professor, oh, he has this degree. Those kind of credentials have no real value when it comes to spiritual knowledge, to actually understand about life and who we are and where life came from. You have to go beyond material science. You have to come to the higher platform. All right, you have any questions so far? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. One question was raised that Dhruv Maharaj already saw the Lord. So, and he's already gotten self-realization. Then why does uh, the Lord still give, fulfill his desire to have such a great kingdom? Because his original desire was material. Yes. And then now after he's seeing the Lord, he's, he's understanding, oh, there's no happiness in material life. Then why does the Lord still fulfill his desire? Well, he had that desire in the beginning. He had that desire, and the Lord certainly knew about it. So he wants to, you know, he, the, 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 the point is that if the Lord did not fulfill that material desire, after some time he may desire it again, because he had that desire. He wanted it, so the, you wanted it, okay, you take it. You have your kingdom. And of course, Dhruva Maharaj, because he, he did become purified, but still, although he became purified, the Lord thought thinks it will be good for him to have the kingdom. And to, then he will understand what it was all about, what it was like. He will realize how foolish he was to actually approach the Lord with material desires. He came there with that material desire. He really wanted to get a kingdom greater than his father. He wanted to be a big man, have a power. So Krishna gave it to him. You have it. And then, of course, he regretted it. But, you know, he has to accept the Lord's plan, that the Lord wants him to have this experience of actually being the king and understanding the problems which are there. Without actually having that position, then you don't really know. And again, the material desire, again, the desire would come that, well, maybe I... Yeah, the material desire can come. For some time he became pure, but again the desire can come. Material desires will come. They do come in the heart. 
they rise up. The weeds, the seeds are there in the heart. The seed of desire for material position, recognition, opulence, respect, it's there and the seed will grow. So the Lord wants to satisfy that desire, to give him these things. And then he can actually understand how wrong he was to actually approach Krishna with that mood. And of course, that's what happened. The Lord gave him the kingdom. He had to rule the kingdom. How many years was it? 36,000 years, something yeah, like that. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so after, after ruling, then he retired. He could give it up. He could go. And he did. He went to Badarik Ashram. And he was in Badarik Ashram. And he was there doing tapasya, preparing himself to go back or to go on, preparing himself for his spiritual journey to go on. And so while he was in Badarik Ashram, after some time, then an aeroplane came and took him, took him to Dhruvaloka, to the pole star. So he got his desire. Because if the, that, that seed of desire is there in the subtle form, it will manifest itself again. There are so many desires in the heart, Guru Maharaj. Yes. So we have to be very careful what you keep in your heart. So can we pray That's to Krishna to help us take away these material desires? Well, you should be, yes. But you have to chant also. If you chant the holy name, if you do devotional service, then Krishna can relieve you of the material desires. Lord Chaitanya said, Chaito Darpana Marjanam. The chanting of the holy name cleanses the mirror of the mind. So the mirror of of the mind is the heart, and so it takes away all the material desires. As it said, it ex extinguishes the blazing fire of material life. So material life is like that, like a blazing forest fire, and the chanting of the Maha Mantra extinguishes that blazing fire. So kirtan is very important. Kirtan and chanting japa, the holy name, hearing about Krishna, it all helps us to put out the blazing fire of material life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. There's another question. There's a question on the chat. Nibika, would you like to personally ask the question? You can just unmute. Yeah, we were just talking, Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna. So we were just talking about, uh, you, you mentioned about how this world was formed. And I was just wondering that there is so much of importance of uh, the navel from where the lotus and we all come from. Shouldn't we be meditating and chanting more on focusing our mind on the navel then? We are praying to sun, moon. So I was just curious about that. This came to my mind like that. Yeah. Well, pray to the sun. The sun is like the eye of the universal body. And the moon is like the mind of the universal body. And Brahma takes birth from the navel. Lord Brahma is like the intelligence of the universal body. So these are all different parts. If you want to understand the universal body of the Supreme Lord, you can see all the different things, everything which is in the universe, you can see them all in relation to the body of the Supreme Lord. Sometimes people contemplate that what we call the Vishwarup or the universal form is also described in Bhagavad Gita. There's a description there about the Vishwarup, 
because Krishna, while he was at Kurukshetra, he showed that form to Arjun. So we can contemplate God in that sense, but it's for for devotees, people who have some devotion, who are uh, in, inclined towards to worship the Lord, then they will they know the Lord as a person. They know him in a more personal way, as just like Lord Krishna. Or maybe you worship Lord Ramachandra, or maybe you prefer Lord Narayan. But we, we think of the Lord in one of these ways, rather than just some gigantic form, which is made up of so many different elements of the creation. But either way, you can contemplate the, cre the Creator, God, in these different aspects. The, the, the Vishwarupa, the universal form, is, is it's quite awesome and frightening to see it. Arjuna, when he saw it at Kurukshetra, he was not inclined, he didn't like it, and he even felt some fear himself in just seeing that, that form, because it was so powerful and it was so awesome. And so he asked Krishna, please show me your other form. I'd rather see you in the forearm form. And then from the forearm form, then he asked Krishna to go back to his original form. And Lord Krishna then appeared in his two-arm form. So Lord Krishna has many forms. He's some one of his names is Anantarup. He has countless forms, you see, and some of them are frightening and some are pleasing. So devotees, we prefer to focus our attention on the pleasing form. We like the all attractive form of Lord Krishna, who is decorated with a peacock feather and playing on the flute. And he's standing in a three bow, a threefold bending form, and uh, he, he he's uh, under the the moonlight night. His... In this way, we imagine Lord Krishna standing on the banks of the Yamuna, playing on his flute in a threefold bending form, and he's decorated with peacock feathers and so on. We consider Krishna in that way more pleasing, more loving, rather than the awesome, majestic, powerful form. And that Vishwarup form, sometimes we describe it as a form of godless opulence. Godless opulence. It's opulent, certainly opulent, but where is God? You know, it's not very clear where is God in that form. So we like to focus on the personal form, the personal feature of the Supreme, rather than just something vague and impersonal. You can understand? Yes. yes. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Will we read some more? You're muted, Shilpa. Sorry about that, Guru Maharaj. So I'll share the screen and this is the next one. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, yeah. yeah. Twam, twam nitya mukta parishuda vibuddha atma Kutasta adi purusho bhagavams tri adisha yad budhyavastitam akanditaya swadristya drashtastita vadimako vyatirikta ase. Translation. Mm. 
My Lord, by your unbroken transcendental glance, you are the supreme witness of all stages of intellectual activities. You are eternally liberated. Your existence is situated in pure goodness and you are existent in the super soul without change. You are the original personality of Godhead, full with six opulences, and you are eternally the master of the three modes of material nature. Thus you are always different from the ordinary living entities. As Lord Vishnu, you maintain all the affairs of the entire universe. And yet you stand aloof and are the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. An atheistic argument against the supremacy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead states that if God the Supreme Person appears and disappears and sleeps and awakens, then what is the difference between God and the living entity? It's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes these kind of questions are asked. Certainly, you could say, well, it's quite a good argument. What is the difference between God and the living entity? He appears and disappears. We appear also and we disappear. And he sleeps and he wake, wakes up. We also sleep, but we wake up. And we're offering food in the temples. We offer food. We, he's eating and we are also eating. And you go to the temple, maybe in the afternoon or in the evening, temples close, the deity is resting, just like we also rest. What is the difference between us? So we'll get the answer here. Dhruva Maharaj is carefully distinguishing the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead from that of the living entities. He points out the following differences. The Lord is eternally liberated. Whenever he appears, even within the material world, he is never entangled by the three modes of material nature. He is therefore known as Triadisha, the master of the three modes of material nature. In Bhagavad Gita, it is said, Devi Esha Gunamai Mamamaya Duradhyaya. The living entities are all entangled in the three modes of material nature. The external energy of the Lord is very strong. But the Lord, as the master of the three modes of material nature, is ever liberated from the action and reaction of those modes. He is therefore uncontaminated, as stated in the Ishopanishad. The contamination of the material world does not affect the Supreme Godhead Krishna therefore says in the Bhagavad Gita that those who are rascals and fools think of him as an ordinary human being, not knowing his param bhavan. Param bhavan refers to his being always transcendentally situated. Material contamination cannot affect him.
What happened? Is that the end of the purport, Shilpa? Yes, Guru Maharaj, the purport ended there. Oh, okay. Oh, so sorry. No, I'm sorry. There is. Yeah, yeah another difference. I'm sorry about that. Okay, another difference between the Lord and the living entity, because, you know, we're thinking, you know, what's the difference? We, we appear and he appears, he disappears, we disappear. He sleeps, we sleep. He wakes up, we wake. What's the difference? So Srila Prabhupada is explaining some differences. In the first paragraph, he explained that we are under the control of the material nature. We are controlled by the material energy, our eating and sleeping and these things. We are controlled by the material energy. But Krishna is never under the control of the material nature. He is always the controller. He's above the material nature. Now we he will hear another difference. Another difference between the Lord and the living entity is that a living entity is always in darkness. Even though he may be situated in the mode of goodness, there are still so many things which are unknown to him. But it is not the same for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He knows past, present and future and everything that is happening in everyone's heart. Bhagavad Gita confirms this. Veda ham samatitani. The Lord is not part of the soul. He is the unchangeable supreme soul, and the living entities are his parts and parcels. The living entity is forced to appear in this material world under the direction of Daiva Maya. But when the Lord appears, he comes by his own internal potency, Atma Maya. Besides that, a living entity is within the time of past, present and future. His life has a beginning, a birth, and in the conditioned state, his life ends with death. But the Lord is Adi Purusha, the original person. In the Brahma Samhita, Lord Brahma offers his respect to the Adi Purush, Govinda, the original person who has no beginning, whereas the creation of this material world has a beginning. The Vedanta says, Janmad Yashya Yata, everything is born from the Supreme, but the Supreme has no birth. He has all the six opulences in full and beyond comparison. He is a master of material nature. His intelligence is not broken under any circumstances and he stands aloof although he is the maintainer of the whole creation. As stated in the Vedas, Kata Upanishad, Nityo Nityanam Chaitananas Chaitananam The Lord is the supreme maintainer. Living entities are meant to serve him by offering sacrifices, for he is the rightful enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices. Therefore, everyone should engage himself in the devotional service of the Lord with his life, his riches, his intelligence, and his words. This is the original constitutional position of the living entities. One should never compare the sleeping of an ordinary living entity to the sleeping of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the Kajyo Ocean. There is no stage at which the living entity can compare to the Supreme Person. 
the Mayavadi philosophers, being unable to adjust to all this, come to the conclusion of impersonalism or voidism. So it's an interesting point. Prabhupada raises this question. People often think like that. They, when they see Krishna, they think, oh, he's just a, a person just like me. He has one, he has a nose, he has two eyes, he has a mouth, he has ears. Oh, he plays the flute, all right, so what? So many people play the flute. Oh, he has long black hair, so what? So many people have long black hair. What's the difference between Krishna and an ordinary person? Oh, there's a big difference. First of all, you have, you have to understand that Krishna's body, Krishna's body Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we can hear you, Guru Manat. Why is it echoing? Why is it echoing? Oh, oh really? I can't hear any echo. My voice is being repeated. Um, I'm not sure, Guru Maharaj, to us it's very clear. There's no, rep no repetition? No. 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 Well, she might turn off the mic and then it won't echo anymore. Shilpa, you can turn off your mic and it won't echo. Yeah. Hare Krishna. All right. Yes. So we have to understand Lord Krishna has a body, but his body is different from our body. Lord Krishna's body is spiritual. We have material bodies. Our bodies take birth. Lord Krishna actually doesn't take birth. Lord Krishna appears, but he's not actually taking birth because the Lord Krishna's form is eternal. Our form is material and our form undergoes, undergoes change. When Lord Krishna appeared, he appeared, of course, well, in Mathura, he appeared in the forearm form as Narayan. But then he took the form of a baby just to satisfy the desire of Vasudev and Devaki. And as a baby, then he enacted childhood pastimes and he grew up and he grew up to the stage of being a young man. And then he never grew, he didn't grow any older than a young man. He always remained eternally young, although he was in the world 125 years, still he was like a young man. You, 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 it doesn't happen to ordinary people. Our bodies all age. But Lord Krishna has a spiritual body. His body is not made of blood and bones and things like that. The body of Lord Krishna, his form, is made up of Satchit Ananda. It's full of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. It's the spiritual form. So although it appears like Lord Krishna is taking birth, the Lord Krishna is just enacting the drama just for his own pleasure. He's performing his lila. It appears like he took birth and then he he also did a trick when he disappeared and people thought, oh, he's dead now, he's being killed. It was all a drama. Just like in the movie, when you watch the movies, you see people, you see people killing and dying, but it's all movies, it's just a drama, it's not real. So similarly, Lord Krishna, when he comes in this world, everything he's doing, it's all just Leela. It's his pastimes for his enjoyment, for his pleasure. 
So Lord Krishna appears to be taking rest, but his taking rest is very different from when we take rest. We take rest, we are controlled by the modes of nature, by the material energy. We feel tired, we feel sleepy, but Lord Krishna, he is the controller of the material energy. We are controlled by the material energy. He is the controller. That is the difference between him and us. We are controlled. We have to eat. We have to sleep. Lord Krishna doesn't have to do these things. He may do them. That is his lila. That is just for his pastime. But he doesn't have to do these things. We do. We we have to do them. We are controlled. But he is free. He can choose what he likes to do. So it's very difficult for people to understand Krishna because he does. He, he looks like, a, you know, he's just a young man. Why is he doing all these things? We have to understand that eternally he's a young man. He never ages. Your husbands, they all get old in course of time. They will all age, all the men of this world. We have material bodies and we age. And with age comes disease and then death. Lord Krishna, his appearance in the world is compared to the sun. Just like when the sun rises in the morning, it's not a new sun. It's the same sun which appears every day. In the night, we don't see the sun. But the sun is in some other place. If you go around the planet, then you can come to a place where the sun is in the sky. It may be night in Taiwan, but if you go to America, it may be daytime. It's the same sun. One place the sun is hidden from vision, and another place you can see the sun. But it's the same sun. In the same way Krishna appears, and then he disappears. And then he will appear again in some other form, another avatar, and then he will disappear. This is how Lord Krishna enacts his pastimes with his devotees. To understand Krishna, we have to hear about Krishna. We have to hear. And you have to also understand certain things. One of the important things you have to understand is that there is such a thing as inconceivable energy. Achintya Shakti, inconceivable powers, powers which we cannot even imagine, so great. That is Krishna. He is described by the word Bhagavan. Bhagavan, when he speaks in the Bhagavad Gita, they will say Bhagavan Uvacha. Krishna is speaking. Krishna is Bhagavan, one who has opulences. We have some opulence. You may have some wealth, but you don't have wealth equal to Krishna. Even you may be a great, maybe you're a Middle East sheikh. You know, the oil barons in the Middle East, the sheikhs, they're very rich. They have a lot of money. But they don't have wealth equal to Krishna. Their wealth is insignificant compared to the wealth of Krishna. For example, 
you know, in the, in England, they have well the, the the Queen of England. Of course, she just died recently, but the Queen of England she has a crown. They have a crown which they give for the Queen, and that on on that crown there's beautiful jewels. So she has one crown with jewels. Lord Krishna had sixteen thousand one hundred and eight queens, and each of his queens had many crowns. Try to understand the difference that, you know, whatever wealth a person has today, you know, Bill Gates, what does he have? You know, maybe one island or a couple of islands somewhere. He owns some, he owns some network. But what is his wealth compared to the wealth of Krishna? It is insignificant. Now, Krishna not only has wealth greater than anyone, he has also knowledge greater than anyone. He could speak the Bhagavad Gita in two hours or whatever. He could speak the whole Bhagavad Gita. We are studying it our whole lives, trying to understand. Krishna has some he has wealth, he has knowledge, he has strength. Somebody very strong. Krishna could pick up the Govardhan hill, hold it up with the one finger of his left hand for seven days and nights. You know, you watch people in the Olympic Games when they have, they will lift a weight up. They lift it up, lift it up, and they hold it for two seconds and crash. They can hold it for a couple of seconds, and then they have to drop it. Krishna was holding the Govardhan hill without any trouble, no sweat. So one of the opulences is strength, another was wealth and knowledge. Then he has also fame. You know, people who are famous today, they're forgotten about in a few years or a few months even. Our fame is very temporary, but Krishna has been famous for centuries, for thousands of years. Krishna has been famous. And Krishna is famous not only on this planet, but all over the creation fame, then also beauty, and then also renunciation. Krishna is not attached to any of these things. He can give them all up very easily. Try to understand the supremacy of Lord Krishna, how he is over everyone, how he is the Supreme Lord, and all opulence is actually his. We are trying to get some opulence. We're trying to make some money. We do some business and try to make some money. Krishna doesn't have to try and make money. It's all his. It's already his. He doesn't need to get, he's not trying to get rich. It's all his. So he doesn't have to worry about trying to make money or trying to be famous or any of these things. He has everything. So when we understand Krishna factually, then we will naturally want to surrender to him and we will want to become his friend. No. We like to have friends who are very famous, who are very important. We like friends who are rich. We like, you know, people like that. So Krishna is the best friend of everyone. Don't you want to be friendly with Krishna? Yeah, I think so. I think we should. If we don't, yes. if we yes. don't. If we don't want to be friends with Krishna, must be something wrong with us. Yeah. 
So this is the point. Dhruva Maharaj is appreciating Lord Krishna's supreme position over everyone. Okay, are there any questions, anything? Do you have any doubts? Just keep reading, you'll, you'll become convinced. Everything is in the book. Seems like no questions for the moment. Okay. Thank you so much. You. Are, they, are, are these are these ladies all Taiwanese? All from Taiwan? Yes. All from Taiwan. Yes. Only Chandra Didi, she is from India. Uh -huh. The rest of us are Taipei. Okay. Taipei. Yeah, we read in the mornings. Okay. So I hope I didn't change your schedule too much. No. No, no we read in the morning also and we, we met now again. Oh, so that okay. was good. Okay. Okay, we're having a Ratiatra here. We're having Ratiatra here in, uh, well, I'm in Butterworth, Butterworth, Malaysia. And we have a Ratiatra procession this afternoon. So I have to go to that. Wow, wishing you a great Ratiatra, Guru Maharaj. And yet you agree to read with us. You're really too kind on us. Yeah, well, it's so hot here, you know, Ratiatra is in the evening here. Because I remember <laughs> one for one of the Ratyatras. What's that? You were in Taiwan. Guru you remember Guru. what? Yeah, you were in Taiwan for one of the Ratyatras a few years back. I remember. Really? Yeah, you were here. We have the pictures. <laughs> in Taipei. In Ratyatra. Taipei. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's getting better, it's getting more successful, huh? you're getting more people coming now. Yes, Maharaj, I'm from Penang. Sorry? I'm from Penang, Guru Maharaj, originally, oh. born and oh. brought up. Oh, really, you're from Penang? Yes. Oh, we're having, we're having Ratiatra in Penang tomorrow. Tomorrow, oh. yes, okay. They're over on the island tomorrow, today on the mainland at Butterworth. Yes, yeah. And tomorrow at Penang. <laughs> no, you're there in Taiwan, huh? from Penang. Yeah, it's got married and I've settled here now. In okay. <laughs> and I'm in Malaysia. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Guru. Nice to meet you all. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.